Hello everyone, my name is Maryam Askari and I'm a fifth year PhD student at University of California, Irvine in Mechanical Engineering Department. Today I want to talk about my research which is using solid oxide fuel cell technology, integrating with this, this technology with liquid desiccant to provide cooling and power for data center application. Just think about how much you are dependent to the internet technology. How many emails do you send per day? Or now that you are at home because of COVID-19, how many Zoom meetings do you have per day? All of these are dependent to data centers. Right now, data centers are responsible for 2% of the electricity in the United States. But in five years, they are going to be responsible for up to 20% of the electricity in the United States. Right now, data centers are responsible for 2% of the world's carbon emission, but in five years, they are going to be responsible for up to 6% of these carbon emissions. If you look into a traditional data centers, only 17% of the energy of the fuel goes to the server, which is very inefficient. And if you look into a data centers, there are two big consumers of energy. The first one is servers, which is exactly where we want our energy to go. But the second ones are cooling systems. Data centers need cold and humidified air to prevent any damages to servers. As the society relies more and more on internet technology and data centers, there are needs for more reliable data centers. Right now, data centers need 99.49% electricity reliability, but electrical grid can only provide 99%. Only in 2017, there have been more than 3,500 power outages due to natural disasters. And for every single second of downtime of data centers, eBay data center, they have lost $6,000. And for all of these downtimes, we are losing our data. So the solution for an efficient and reliable data center is using cytoxide fuel cell technology, which is fuel flexible, has high efficiency and low emission. And that's exactly why big companies like Apple, eBay, and Equix, they have been using large scale fuel cells for powering their data centers. A couple of years ago, National Fuel Cell Research Center, in collaboration with Microsoft, they investigated the concept of using one small scale fuel cell for powering one single server rack, which eliminates the need for backup generator and also eliminates all the inefficiency associated with distrib distribution and transmission lines. But using these high temperature fuel cells, gives us the opportunity for cogeneration application because of the high quality exhaust that is available. And that's why I introduced the idea of not only using one small scale fuel cell for powering one single server rack, but using the exhaust of this single fuel cell for producing cold and humidified air in a desiccant humidifier to provide the cooling that we need for one single server rack. I investigated this idea both theoretically and experimentally. I used my model to look at seven different locations that Microsoft has data center in the United States. Three of these locations need both simplification and cooling. So my results shows that if we run our cytoxide fuel cell technology continuously and provide cooling and produce cooling, we are able to provide between 15% to 25% of the cold and humidified air that we need for one single server rack. There is also another scenario that we can look at to the storage, which means that, for example, for a place like Virginia, which only needs dehumidified air only six months between May and uh, October, we can use the rest of the year to produce a strong desiccant and store this strong desiccant in a storage tank. And then when we need dehumidified air, we use this strong desiccant to produce cold and dehumidified air for our data centers. And when we look at this specific scenario, we are able to provide not only the power that we need for 
our single server rack, but also we are able to provide the cold and humidified air that we need for that one single server rack. Thank you for your attention and please email me if you have any questions. My name is Chloe Groom and I'm a 2019 ARCS scholar. My research uses quantum chemistry to find ways to make hydrogen fuel cell vehicles more affordable. Nobody likes breathing smog. If you can afford it, driving a Tesla is a great option to drive greener. My research advisor owns one and I won't lie, I'm a little jealous. Even so, we do research together on another type of green car that runs on hydrogen gas. Better than Tesla's, they charge faster and can go farther on a single charge. But just like Tesla's, they're also expensive. And this is because the batteries in hydrogen fuel cell vehicles need platinum metal to work. And like any rapper can tell you, platinum is better than gold. Unfortunately, the price tag reflects that. A single handful of platinum is more than $5,000. So for hydrogen cars to be affordable, we have to find a way to replace the platinum. We know that single atoms of iron stuck to special surfaces come close to the performance of platinum. As gas flows through the cell, it lands on these single atoms and they get broken apart, which drives the chemistry. Unfortunately, even single atoms of iron aren't good enough. We can't go smaller than a single atom. So I decided to explore other metals besides iron. Luckily, I do computer simulations. So I can look at more metals much faster than running experiments. The problem is that even though I found other candidates that were better than iron, they still couldn't beat platinum. I thought about literally simulating every single transition metal on the periodic table, but I didn't want to spend months in front of my computer screen ripping my hair out. Then I realized that I'm forgetting something. The surface. These single atoms, as I said, are stuck on a surface. By changing the chemistry of the surface, I actually made the metal atoms magnetic. I'm still working on understanding why, but making them magnetic increased their performance by over 40%. I think it's because the additional magnetism helps tug the gas molecules apart that land on the single metal atoms. Going forward, I'm doing more simulations, looking at how the magnetism changes with the surface chemistry. I'm this close to beating platinum. This has huge implications for the future. Without platinum driving up the cost, we could all be driving hydrogen cars that are much better for the planet. We can be better than a Tesla without the price tag. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, my name is Melissa Thone and I'm a fifth year PhD student in chemical and biomolecular engineering. And I'm excited to share a little bit about my research with you today. When it comes to taking on cancer, we hear a lot about early screening, better detection, and advances in therapy. But what about prevention? Getting more exercise, avoiding smoking, and even articles suggesting diet changes, such as cutting out coffee, can help with prevention. But none of these are a sure bet. And I don't know about you, but I'm definitely not giving up on coffee. So what else can we do? The answer right now is not too much but that is an issue I've committed to changing. In my research, I'm working to create a preventative vaccine so that one day we have a proactive approach to preventing cancer and we can take action before the patient ever gets sick. So how do vaccines work? Pieces of the dangerous substance you want to educate the immune system against are injected into the patient with the hope that they will be taken up by the antigen presenting cells and presented on their surface to T cells and B cells to educate them on what to look for, with the end goal of being to produce memory cells that will always remember to be on the lookout for that dangerous substance. Traditional approaches have included injecting cancer proteins or nanoparticles. 
but were rapidly cleared from the body and were not effective in preventing tumor growth. So somebody thought, why don't we skip the middleman and just use antigen presenting cells as the cancer vaccine itself? A company called Dendrion did exactly this when they made Provenge, which is a dendritic cell uh, cancer vaccine for prostate cancer. This was approved by the FDA in 2010 because during clinical trials, it showed to be safe and improved survival. However, less than 1% of the dendritic cells reached the lymph nodes. That's where they need to go to educate the other immune cells. And control of maturation state was also an issue. To me, that's the most important part because an immature dendritic cell requests a tolerance response, while a mature dendritic cell will demand an attack. And in the case of cancer, that can be the difference between life and death. Ultimately, in 2014, Dendron filed for bankruptcy. And while we think they were on the right track, the ideal platform would maintain the cell-to-cell -cell communication ability of these dendritic cells, but with more control. And we think that extracellular blebs, or EBs, might be a promising solution. Extracellular blebs are particles made from cells in the micro and the nano scale. Up close, they're phospholipid bilayers, identical to cells with all molecules needed for cell-to-cell -cell communication built in. Unlike cells, they're not living, and once produced, they can't change or lose efficacy. In other words, you gain a lot of control. So what we're doing throughout this work is isolating bone marrow from our patients, differentiating that bone marrow into immature or mature dendritic cells, and then making particles from these, the extracellular blebs. And so throughout this, we're testing these four groups, immature cells, mature cells, immature particles, and mature particles, in their ability to activate T cells to eradicate tumors. So in order for these particles to work and stimulate immune cells, they have to look identical to the cells they are produced from. So we investigated how similar they were. We took immature cells and incubated them with a cancer peptide and a chemical that induces maturation over time. At various time points, we checked how similar the EBs were to the cells, and we found that they were nearly identical. At this point, we knew the EBs could talk the talk, but next was to test if they could walk the walk. In other words, would they actually work? In order to do this, we performed a tumor challenge where we vaccinated mice twice and then administered cancer cells, expressing the protein, which in theory, the immune system should have been educated about. You can see pictures from our study of day 30 here, with our controls, saline, cancer peptide, and cancer protein, all showing large tumors, as these have never worked as effective cancer vaccines in the past. Our mature cell and uh, particle groups here show almost no tumors at day 30. And what's the most interesting, in my opinion, is the immature group. So again, this should be the group of asking for a tolerance response. In the cell vaccine group, you can see almost no tumors, while in the blub or particle group, you see a large tumor. If this was truly a tolerance response, both should look the same, but it's possible that the cells, because they're living, changed and requested a different response. So this goes back to that ability of having higher control with our particles. If you look at the data more long term, so this graph on the left, we have tumor volume on the y axis and time on the x. If we focus on the red and the purple data, which is the mature cell and particle groups, you can see that over time, tumors were totally eradicated. And if you look on the graph on the right hand side, this resulted in 100% survival rates. So, in conclusion, we developed a cell free, highly controllable cancer vaccine. The blebs, or these particles, mirrored the parent cell's molecular presentation nearly identically, and they were capable of preventing tumor growth and eradicating tumors in vivo. I'd like to thank NSF, GRFP, UCI Graduate Division, and of course, ARCS for all of your funding. Thank you, it's meant a lot and it's done a lot for me. Also, my lab mates for their contributions. And if you have any questions, please contact me at my email below. Thank you. Hello, my name is Bryce Wilson. I'm a first year scholar working under 
Professor Venugopalan and Professor Botvinik in the Chemical Engineering Department. My research is focused on exploring how physical forces like touch, strain, and flow play a role in cell biology. I want you to imagine a game of telephone. In a game of telephone, you whisper a message into somebody's ear and it gets passed down the room. The fun of the game of telephone is to see how much the message has changed by the time it gets to the end of the room. Biology is the language of life and it's spoken in these games of telephone. And as a biologist, what we want to do is precisely understand this game given any room. So how we can do this is to basically mic up everybody in the room. So given any message, how is that person likely to pass it to their neighbor? And we can think of a disease as when this game of telephone goes wrong. I don't mean somebody changing the message, that's the whole point of the game. What I mean is the message being completely lost or changed in an incomprehensible way. Now I'm going to change this game up a little bit more. In this game of telephone, instead of whispering in your neighbor's ear, what if half of the students in the room wrote the message on each other's hands with their finger? Now the microphones don't work anymore. We, we could possibly lose this message somewhere in the row and we don't understand how it's being changed or how it's being lost. So when cells are communicating with touch and passing these signals down biochemical pathways, our existing probes or our microphones don't work anymore. What my team does is we've developed the first probe to figure out how we can study cells when they're communicating with touch. So what our probe is, is basically a bubble. We focus a laser down nearby the cells and this bubble expands out. And when the bubble expands out, a tiny tsunami flows away from the bubble and the cells feel this tsunami in the same way they'd feel blood flow, for example, or trauma. There's some advantages to our technique. First of all, it's variable in force. We can create a large bubble that kills a bunch of cells and is a huge force on cells that would mimic, for example, a traumatic brain injury. Or we could create a small bubble that induces a flow very similar to the blood flow in cells and we can study heart disease with it. This is a very scalable renovation and it can be used in a 96 well plate and test hundreds of drugs at a time. In the future, we hope to expand this technology into 3D spaces. None of the cells in your body exist on a plate in, in a 2D sheet. All the cells in your body exist in a 3D tissue. So in the future, we hope to find ways to expand this bubble into tissue, which would be analogous to a balloon expanding. This is very different than a wave of blood flowing over the cells. So I want to talk about traumatic brain injury again. When we think of traumatic brain injury, we're thinking of an NFL player sustaining many concussions over his career. Well, it turns out the line in the sand isn't at concussion anymore. It, we're seeing symptoms of traumatic brain injury with people that play soccer, for example, from heading the ball. So if the line isn't at concussion anymore, where is it? We thought of an experiment where we can induce bubbles of larger and larger sizes to try to find out exactly when this disease condition occurs. Now this is only one experiment. There are other experiments like with heart disease, for example. We can induce higher and faster flows past these cells to try to see when heart disease conditions start to occur. We think this can really change the field of mechanotransduction and we're really excited.